we have a nerd alert. I wanted to talk about this project. It's my largest 3D print at this point uh, using the Creality CR10S. As you can see, it's, uh, it's quite tall. It's, I believe, about um, 86 inches or something like that. And it's printed in roughly seven inch sections. And uh, it has these little screw holes here. And you can see there's a slight filament difference because I ran out of the first spool and switched over to the second and then a third. And it's a pretty unique design and there's a good reason for that. It's actually covering my uh, mini split pipe over here, which is quite ugly. And you can see roughly this is what it's going to look like. And I couldn't find a cover that was sort of a similar aesthetic that I liked. So I ended up using this, uh, well, I ended up designing in Rhino 3D this uh, pattern. This is a second version. I'm hoping by the end it blends in pretty well. Either way, it was uh, quite a, a lot of learning experience doing this project. One thing I've been enjoying is touching things up using a 3D pen, 3D printing pen. So you can see that uh, I've actually done a bit of welding and periodically I'm letting it sit in one spot to the extent of actually melting it. And uh, so creating these plastic welds and, and just running along here with a weaker weld in between. And I actually did quite a lot of repair. You probably noticed in that uh, initial time-lapse video that uh, this went terribly wrong and I was able to salvage it, but then I used that 3D pen to do some plastic welding and then sanded it. And it's not perfect, but that's because I'm going to be putting an enamel product on this. So what you're seeing right now is just the raw 3D print. Uh, everything else that I didn't plastic weld, because that's something I didn't have initially, has simply been super glued together, which does work surprisingly well, but <laughs> I, can, I can tell this thing's a little bit brittle and, and kind of weak. And the secondary purpose for that enamel product is actually to reinforce the print itself. This is only a couple of millimeters thick and in some places even less than that. So it's, uh, it's quite weak. It's 20% infill also. So, you know, and I did a 0.3 millimeter per, which was about the fastest I could do with the nozzle I had. So this was kind of done in a, a quick rush. And even that being a rush job, you know, we're still talking about, um, not sure, 80 hours of printing, something like that quite extensive. So I'm going to be coating this uh, about 7 foot 3D print with this, which is uh, pretty highly recommended. On the weird side, it specifies 73 degrees storage and work time, or uh, work temperature, which is so, I've never seen something so incredibly specific. <laughs> and then it also warns that elevated temperatures reduce life, blah, blah, blah. So it kind of makes you wonder, uh, do they mean at most 73 or at least 73? I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty sure it doesn't matter that much. Anyway, it's um, part A, two to one, part B. So it should be pretty simple. And uh, work, time is, uh, work time is fairly limited. Woo, that is already stinky. I'm pretty sure this thing mentions not being stinky. Uh, that, but it is quite stinky. So, oh my gosh, that's thick. That might be the reason for that temperature. So I'm a, a hair low, I'm more like 70 or 69 than uh, I am at um, 73, that's for sure. And this thing mentions uh, not smelling much like low smell, low VOC and all that stuff, but I can tell you, you know, Fairly stanky. I think part B is the stinky one actually. Maybe they both are, I don't know. It smells kind of like fish. <laughs> it's just surprisingly gross. 
Also says to use a flat tool for stirring and then they send you a popsicle stick with rounded edges. <laughs> Whoa, gosh, that's stinky. I'm gonna have to open the windows and then I'm not gonna be able to maintain 73 very well. Well, this is in the addition and nobody else goes in here really other than my wife to work out and uh, or just walk around really for sanity. Should have read how long you're supposed to mix it. Thoroughly for at least one minute. All right, I'm gonna say that's a minute. I think it smells a bit like ammonia now that I'm thinking about it. All right, so this is with uh, two coats of that uh, epoxy stuff. And I did a coat on the back here. <laughs> this yellow is actually a uh, nonstick butter spray because I put this strip of fiberglass tape on here, this drywall fiberglass tape, and uh, surprise, surprise, it didn't stick. So in a panic, <laughs> I grabbed a bunch of beer cans and sprayed some nonstick on one side and used those to weigh down the piece of fiberglass tape. And although it worked, I have a little bit of cleanup to do and there's some yellow. <laughs> It doesn't seem to have affected the quality of the, uh, the bond or anything, um, but it's not ideal, obviously. So my review of this, this uh, stuff, I don't have the package in front of me right now, but it stinks. Um, I think it may have formaldehyde, I'm not sure. I, I should probably see if there's a list of ingredients, but it just smells terrible. And it, the smell lingers on your hands and even if you use the right ratio when it's fully catalyzed, like this is definitely fully catalyzed, this is it. Um, to me, it just seems like a subpar epoxy that has been branded as being good for, for covering up 3D prints because I could have used any epoxy for this, I'm pretty sure. And uh, by the way, if there are any updates on anything I say in any of my videos, please check the comments or the uh, video description for clarification. I'll pin whatever I think is relevant in the comments, but I can only pin one thing to the top. So that's the best source. All right, this is after uh, going through a couple pieces of sandpaper, 80 grit. I'm not gonna bother uh, refining that at all. I can see that there are some uh, divots and such that I was not able to completely remove, uh, but I'm not gonna sweat it. Now, I did actually have a board under this to support it. However, I can tell you that it's, uh, it's definitely pretty strong. The only problem is that this epoxy stuff, epoxy, again, I'm gonna, <laughs> whatever it is, resin, I don't know. Um, it's not perfect. <clears throat> it does not fully support it. I have a, a crack going through here um, and that did not salvage that really. I'm not going to sweat it though because this is not really going to be under much stress. I guess I, uh, one thing I need to kind of keep an eye open for is trying to not totally cover these holes in, in this paint. The sanding was pretty easy. Uh, easier than sanding PLA on its own because that tends to get melty. So, so it's a harder surface, so it's a little bit easier to deal with. It's more brittle. You can see roughly what this print uh, ended up looking like. So I'm not sure if I'm going to do anything else with this or if this is kind of the final look. Um, like there's a little gap there and there. I'll probably touch it with some acrylic caulk and call it good enough. I was potentially going to run a line of acrylic caulk down the sides of this, but I kind of like knowing that it's a separate piece from the wall. You know, I, I don't really want to hide it. So I kind of want to show it off. It's just, at first I thought that area looked really busy, and then now that it's been finished up a bit, to me it looks more like a kind of a contemporary controls area. So I kind of like the look of having so much stuff in this one little area here. Anyway, if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe and uh, please share. I'm gonna do a series of these large 3D prints and talk about a few different projects.
So, as always, thanks for watching. And for those that are curious, this is how the room is coming along now. There's a lot of projects going on at once. This is uh, sort of what my mosaic project is looking like at the moment. It's not done. So of the large 3D prints I've been working on, that was the first. This mosaic, this wall of mosaic was the second, which is uh, about eight foot by four foot. I'll do a separate project video about that. And then the last thing I wanna do, right up there I want to print a real life sized raptor fossil skeleton, um, which is like, only like two, I think two or three feet tall, depending on stature, and then like five feet long, tail to nose. So I just, I, I love dinosaur fossils, and uh, I, I found a skeleton of one online, like the models. You have to pay money for it. You probably don't have to, but I will. I'll support the artist. Uh, but <laughs> I was just so tickled that somebody put in the effort to do a, a totally realistic uh, fossil skeleton that uh, I'm definitely gonna hang that from the ceiling. <laughs> that's just the kind of person I am. <laughs> anyway, so this room is coming along. That door will be switched out to something else. And we, we like the openness of this room, but we're gonna have to jam this this uh, rowing machine somewhere pretty permanently. And it's just kind of already getting to a point where this room is gonna fill up pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, that's just how it goes. So we have to be pretty selective. This is all the uh, wood that I had uh, milled, air kilned, you know, seasoned in the air, and then planed down to just not anything specific, just straightening it out basically. And then I brought it in here to do final drying. It's been like growing mold and stuff for a couple of years outside. So I hit it with some uh, borax dissolved in water to help kill off any fungus while it dries in here. And bugs, of course. There's probably some bugs on the surface. Nothing major, but, and I'm going to end up planing it down even further again anyway. Uh, but all of this stuff, I'm not sure about this piece. I'll try to work it in, but all of this stuff is, is gonna go up there and wrap around all of that. So, yeah, this, you'll probably notice there's a lot of creativity and sort of contemporary architecture going on in here, and that's because it is the exact opposite of the rest of the house, which is a modular house, so it's, it's very boring, and it has low ceilings. So, I think uh, that's about 16 feet from here to there. So <laughs> that, was, that was very much on purpose. So when I designed this, uh, this building, this addition, I wanted to just escape all of the, the normalcy of, of uh, conventional architecture and just do something really kind of dramatic. And it wasn't actually going to be conditioned at first. But then I thought, why, why do a three season room if you can do a four season room with just adding one little bit? And it wasn't going to be like all these closed walls and windows. It was going to be a screened porch and then it was going to be kind of a sunroom. And now it's sort of like, I'm not sure what you'd call it. It's, it is really nice though because you can view the wilderness out there and all the way around here. So like I was working out earlier and I could just watch the nature everywhere. I was watching uh, our full-size goat, Sassy, and our baby pygmy goat, Betty, just uh, doing their thing outside in 95, 96 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> and I'm in here at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And I was just thinking, wow, this is, a, this is a pretty sweet deal to be able to enjoy nature from afar without having to uh, uh, get burnt out in the sun. I'll go ahead and put the plans to this on Thingiverse. Uh, I don't know that's going to help anybody else out particularly. It's uh, it's a pretty cool shape. 
you know. So it might be useful as a cover for someone, but it's also incredibly custom, you know. Like that piece down there, that's only because my lines were away from the structural uh, connection right there. So I had to push it out a little bit, you know. And I just decided, you know what, I'm not gonna sweat it. And, you know, I could have done other things with this setup. I could have tried piping it out that way maybe, or, or something like that, but, um, the, the issue is that the roof is right there, you know, and this didn't meet the offset requirements by the manufacturer. Like these side walls are the only walls I could do. And it was between that one and that one. And this one was just slightly closer. And the amount of compressed gas in that unit or in the actual uh, compressor outside was just enough to do at most a 20 foot run. So or it might have been 25 feet. Anyway, so this was just a little bit closer, and I thought, eh, who cares, you know? I'll, I'll leave this fully accessible. It'll be com it will be indoors, so the condenser line will be able to output water really well, and and uh, it's it's a it's a good run from there, like kind of curved and gradual. It's a nice downward gradient. You know, this was a very utilitarian way to do this rather than an aesthetic way. And then I decided to uh, add this line cover that's totally custom and just to see how well you can 3D print something like this. And it's not perfect, you can see these little segments, but again, I'm kind of celebrating what it is. I'm not really trying to hide the fact that it's a 3D print.